Hello everyone. Welcome to the first seminar of our uh, uh, series for this year for the P30 Center for Environmental Health. My name is Andrea Baccarelli. I'm really excited to welcome all of you here. Um, before we dive into today's seminar, our special guest, Dr. Hoyo, I would like to uh, tell you about, take a moment to acknowledge the sponsor of the seminar series, which is the P30 Center for Environmental Health and Justice in Northern Manhattan. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the center, this is the center that spans 15 departments and four different schools at Columbia. And I happen also to be the director of the center and I work closely with the deputy director, Dr. Diana Hernandez. Uh, it provides uh, support to Colombia investigators, um, including intellectual guidance, pilot funding, the look out for our pilot calls. We're all, always happy to give out money and uh, career development assistance, as well as laboratory and data support. Um, the center is part of a larger network of 28 such centers across the country, including one at NC State. And, uh, and also, uh, I would like to invite you, if you are not on our newsletter, to sign up for the newsletter from the center. You can scan the QR code here. I need to get out of the way, perhaps. And uh, or uh, ask uh, our coordinator, Carolina Montes Garcia, to to be signed up. Um, however, without further ado, uh, it's an amazing privilege uh, to have here with us a highly distinguished uh, scientist and speaker, Dr. Catherine Hoyo. Uh, she's an esteemed epidemiologist and molecular epidemiologist, uh, professor and the Good Night Innovation, Dis Innovation Distinguished Chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at North Carolina State University. Her research focuses on the role of environmentally induced alterations in the epigenome and the genesis of common chronic disease. This includes diseases that disproportionately affect minority populations, including cancer and obesity. And of course, she's also a member of the center, the P30 Center for Human Health and the Environment at NC State. So please, thank you, Kari, for being with us. It's been a real pleasure to host you. And uh, please uh, help me, join me in welcoming Dr. Hoyo as we start in her presentation, which will be about aberrant DNA methylation of imprint in control regions in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, thank you. And I think I need Carolina to switch the slides. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bacchetti, for the introduction. It, uh, um, yeah, it is a pleasure to be here, and I am grateful for the invitation because it, it uh, helps me um, think about collaborations as I talk to a lot of you, and uh, it also does help our centers as we uh, have that center-to-center uh, uh, collaboration. I wanted to first talk about my team, my lab, and because who's, without them, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, they have done an incredible job. Uh, there is the uh, molecular uh, side of the team that is uh, uh, led by a molecular geneticist that uh, came with me from Duke. And then there is the epidemiology, uh, and logistics side of things well, that is led by uh, uh, Dr. Vidal. And then this person here actually is an employee of our P30 Center. It, it was an amazing thing to actually have a resource such as this. Uh, he also came from Duke when our center started about 10 years ago. 
And uh, now he decided he's going to be a graduate student and do a PhD. But but having a person like this, uh, with this level of, of expertise is what has made it possible for us to do the science that uh, I'm going to talk about today. And because we are such an interdisciplinary team, there are collaborators on campus that I must acknowledge as well as those that are either uh, left at Duke or those that uh, are new because of the realization that we probably, what we are seeing may not just be environmental contaminants, there may be social stressors that are combined with this and therefore uh, working with this uh, last uh, three um, esteemed professors has been very, very helpful as we think through. And then uh, it has also helped to have um, uh, a, a, an interdisciplinary team of, uh, of, of, of graduate students. So what I'm going to talk about today is really about the imprint control regions uh, that we have been working on for the last 10 years. And the reason that this has become so important uh, it stems from the developmental origins of adult disease, where we are talking about environmental stressors and the fact that they could be mediated by uh, DNA methylation or other epigenetic processes in order to contribute to common chronic diseases. Uh, I will then, with these imprint control regions, try and apply it to a disease uh, because I'm currently working with a neurologist and one of my graduate students who are applying this to uh, this imprint control uh, region methylation marks to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease. So the fact that we are starting early in life, we have spent a lot of time and a lot of money we have spent a lot of money trying to get at the developmental origins of adult disease. We have, um, there is money that we have spent within ECHO. There is money that we spent before ECHO in our own individual cohorts trying to understand the developmental origins of adult disease. And what has, um, and from that, what became clear was that there are diseases based on the early data from the Dutch famine and the Chinese famine study that there are diseases that are acquired uh, much, um, much earlier in life. What's going on here? Okay, thank you. So you are using, okay, yeah. And what we learned a little later, other than the fact that severe caloric restriction, whether it's short-lived and intense, or it is much more chronic and longer term, does produce dyslipidemia, depending on the timing when that exposure occurs. If it, if it occurs later, it seems it affects neurological type diseases. We've also learned from these cohort studies that we have, for an exposure that we all measure well, such as smoking before puberty, that it is associated with obesity, right? On the paternal side, we've learned about transgenerational effects. And from this study, which is really my favorite, it's a much smaller study, but what it has been able to show us is that it doesn't have to be severe caloric restriction. The season of conception had to do with the fact that people were harvesting crop in the Gambia versus the time that they were, um, they were planting the crop. So that small difference in uh, uh, caloric input was able to produce differences in intrauterine growth restriction and preterm. But, so we are talking about a disease, we're talking about exposures that occur very early. This seem to be very important, but we just haven't had a handle on it because be beyond these things that we measure well, the dose matters. Other stressors also matter. The sex in which this happens, in the person in whom this, ex this stressor happens in, also does seem to matter. Yay. This is not, this is not good. I'm sorry. 
So, so what we're talking about, if according to this uh, hypothesis, we are talking about periconception uh, type exposures that include prenatal or early childhood that are actually producing disease phenotype in the uh, way that the exposure then uh, that could be a contaminant can be recorded somewhere and uh, propagated and retained and it usually uh, produces uh, it produces some, some disease. So what we do in our lab is to try and identify these environmentally responsive targets, which are really the molecular alterations so that we can uh, use them for, for, for early detection. So what we have now are, are very limited data. A lot of us have spent a lot of time trying to produce data in early life. Um, there is tons of data available in infancy that where people are collecting sometimes every month, uh, data sometimes every two, three months. And these data um, have, have taught us a number of things about what happens in early life. And usually there are specimens associated with this. Uh, what has been a problem during the, the prenatal period is that the periconceptional period has been um, uh, very obscure. We just don't seem to have the ability to reach that far back using the questionnaire data, uh, the questionnaire data that we have, or the tools that we currently have. Um, uh, this problem here, I think, has been a lot more to do with the uh, interest in the um, in the research community to cover these two areas in order to understand what the pharmacological interventions that happen during patrician and the then the labor when people come in. This is very rudimentary right now. These data are currently um, uh, there's several uh, places, uh, including Duke, who are trying to uh, make some incursions in that space. But otherwise, I think. Uh, especially led by ECHO, I think that we do have reasonable amounts of data that can be, uh, and specimens that can be interrogated in order to understand um, uh, these this, uh, early origins of, uh, of disease. So in uh, our study, this is the example of the study that we have conducted, uh, collected this data when I was still at Duke, what we were trying to do is to get into that space that we cannot reach. We are trying to, the woman shows up sometimes at six weeks. We're trying to get them at their first uh, visit. It, they come in at six weeks and during at six weeks, um, a lot has happened. And really the period we're trying to reach is that one. And sometimes they show up at 12 weeks. So how do we reach uh, that, that period? And what we have used, um, maybe not as well, uh, is the idea that if you have red blood cells with the lifespan of about 120 weeks, uh, which goes beyond this, uh, then probably you will be able to get at least half um, of the picture uh, when you uh, catch a woman during this period of what was going on during, um, during that, um, that, that period. So in that study, I want, all I wanted to emphasize was that it was a very large study and uh, that it was ethnically very diverse. And one of the things we did was to look at the geographic distribution of, um, we actually looked at about 20 uh, chemicals uh, and here I'm just going to talk about the three. And uh, what we found in that study, this is the map of Durham County, um, uh, and Duke sits about uh, at, the, at the bottom there. And what this is, is cadmium exposure, mercury, lead, and arsenic. And on this side is the actual geographic uh, addresses, the street addresses where uh, um, there's women when the idea was to try and figure out whether we are seeing any clustering at all um, in this exposure. And then when it looked like we were seeing um, clusters, 
then we subjected it to some cluster analysis because they are, you know, they're usually parks, you know, places where people live, and then they're um, city buildings that are not occupied. So here we are trying to look at what is the probability that in this geographic space, there is actually clustering of this exposure, suggesting that maybe we are not talking about cigarette smoking here, we are probably talking about something uh, more regionalized, something more specific. So we do that, and what we are finding is this heat map is showing where the probability uh, is highest is, um, is in red. And what we are seeing is we seem like the probability that there is clustering of cadmium at, in this region here is 99%. We see the same for mercury here. We see there are three lead clusters here and, and arsenic. But what we had, this, this we had known about. Uh, the work of Irva Hertz Pichotto had shown that we do have lead clusters in uh, in Europe. So now, uh, if we go to that uh, place where we saw cadmium and lead, what we are seeing is that this cadmium here and the lead <laughs> actually co cluster together. And if you look at the, and this is just the lead, and if you go and find where these are, and these are the census tracts where these people. Uh, actually live. And then uh, this region is about 26,000 people, uh, and most of the people are minoritized uh, populations. And if you compare this to the map that I just, uh, the, to the distribution I showed you before, where we had about 40% uh, um, whites in that population, in the overall population, but that's not where they live, right? So the question then becomes, is it because they know that, that people with resources know about that exposure or not? So we go back, uh, and this was really fostered on us uh, by the community engagement uh, poll who said, well, we are not going to go out into the population and tell them that they, they are exposed when you cannot even tell us uh, whether what is causing the exposure, right? What are the potential sources so that they can at least do something about it? So we go back then and collect uh, additional blood samples and then look at hand wipes, thinking about the sole potential um, uh, routes of exposure and then look at their house dust and, and, and their soils. And what we are seeing here is that contamination, there is contaminated house dust, there's contaminated soil, for both uh, lead and cadmium. Cadmium is what we hadn't known before. We knew about, uh, uh, about lead. So then the question became, is it just in Durham it, because it was an industrial city? Do we see this in Raleigh as well? So then we go and conduct another study. This is maybe a, a, a five years later in Raleigh uh, with uh, uh, collaborators at UNC. And this is the distribution. Again, we wanted to make sure that our population includes ethnic minorities. And our collaborator, uh, Chantel Martin, is a, a social uh, epidemiologist. Um, and the only thing I wanted to share with you in this data was that, yeah, it seems like we have about the same levels. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is that life lives placenta uh, weight. And it seems like, um, we have about um, the same levels because they tend to be 10 times, uh, the levels uh, are 10 times more in <clears throat> lyophilized material than in, um, than in wet. But what we are seeing here is that the cadmium, the higher cadmium concentrations, but not in other, uh, uh, not the arsenic, not the lead, it seems like it is associated with lower birth weight in this population. And it seems, um, it also associates with slower placental weight as well as gestational age uh, in delivery. But it, the idea that this is only happening in one population, yet people live together, because if you look at the, Afri the, the, the African-American population, that's where you have really the highest um, uh, concentrations of, uh, of cadmium. So, uh, and then really thinking about what are, are the effects of cadmium? 
right? We, uh, we have done a, an extensive literature review and there is evidence that, uh, that it is associated with uh, uh, metabolic abnormalities. Uh, but again, uh, as one would expect, these data are very consistent in vitro and in vivo, but when it comes to humans, only about 50% of uh, uh, these agree. And then if we look at neurological top, the, uh, effects here, or what we are seeing is probably the same. Uh, this is a really nice review done by uh, uh, Kelly, and this one was done by uh, a team I haven't met, but what these are agreeing on are also that data on model systems are largely consistent, but when it comes to human studies for uh, neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's, we have problems and our problems are the same as we have in other studies. We are working with cross-sectional data we are, or cross-sectional data or ecological data um, or autopsy studies, we tend to be really small. So these tend to be limited and this is where the, 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 uh, the science is uh, at the moment. So the, 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 the overall challenge we're talking about is when we can measure something reasonably well, like toxic metals that I'm talking about, estimating the timing of exposure and the, and, and the dose is very difficult because we are doing it once. Uh, this cross-sectional analysis, when the actual, when, when there is such wide variation in when along the course of life, and when the doses vary as much as you have seen, makes it really difficult. And then the heterogeneity in the exposure itself, uh, because the populations themselves, as you have seen, they really vary. As we have seen, minoritized populations, for reasons that I am not even sure I understand, seem like either the effects are more, or they seem to have higher levels, uh, even if they were um, randomly uh, selected in a population. So there is a need to think about these exposures and I'm talking about toxic metals, but we can think about other exposures, other social stresses and look at what the intermediate endpoint is, which would be uh, an epigenetic response and how that then would affect uh, the outcome. And at some point when we start seeing the same um, epigenetic response being seen, then that can become a surrogate for our exposure matrix. So we don't need to know about all the exposures out there because we will never know all of them. And we will never know whether the social stressors are more important in this population than not. But if we understood and repeated and repeated and came up with a profile that is related to exposure and try to link it to outcome. I think that would um, uh, be a good thing. And that's where our uh, uh, imprint control regions come in. So when we are talking about epigenetics, what we are saying is that these chemical and non-chemical uh, stressors themselves are going to influence uh, epigenetic programming and that stressor response is going to be to nudge the epigenome sometimes ever so lightly as that uh, is being recorded on the epigenome. And this is what cumulatively is going to contribute to disease. And this is the hypothesis that we are trying to test. So what we did first was to use genome, uh, uh, the whole genome by sulfate sequencing with 10X coverage in a subset of mothers and children from, um, from the nest cohort and tried to really deeply measure DNA methylation, not in arrays, but in making sure that we cover 80% of the genome as opposed to four to 5% of it. And then we designed the study so that we have people who have almost no cadmium, high cadmium, and then, uh, looked at what they call the credible methylation difference. And for us, it was, we tried 10% and we tried 20%, we tried 15% to see whether we are seeing um, any differences um, in the results. And what we found here was 
uh, using 10%, we found about 2000 differentially methylated regions that seemed like they were specific to cadmium exposure in adults, in the mothers. And then in children, there was another 640, but there was um, uh, an overlap of about 98. So when we look at this 98, that seems like it's in both. Are we talking about the type of methylation marks that did not change, that have been like that over time? Or is this coincidence, right? We will never know that because again, we are talking about cross-sectional data. So the obstacles that we have with uh, uh, DNA methylation data that I'm talking about are the, the fact that they do drift with age, right? You are looking at these you are finding 1,900 in mothers and 600 in children. And part of that is just epigenetic drift. And then of course they vary by cell type, they vary by tissue type, yet for studies that we do, we only have one or two cell types that are accessible. And of course the reverse causality issue that you have the temporal ambiguity between exposure and outcome given the, um, the fact that the internal environment itself may actually shift the epigenetic marker rather than, uh, than, than, the, than the exposure, which is the reason why um, imprint control regions become important uh, because these are a different set of epigenetic marks well, that are characterized by parent of origin specific uh, gene expression. Uh, in this first part here, this is, this is when a normal somatic that the normal uh, cell is functioning. You've got both maternal allele and paternal allele functional. And when there is um, paternally, maternally expressed, uh, controlled by uh, uh, methylation at this imprint control region, this uh, allele gets silenced while only one of them, while the, the maternal allele is being expressed. And vice versa, you have another uh, imprint control region example where the maternal allele is silenced by DNA methylation and the paternal allele is, uh, is functioning. Uh, one, one thing that we find very attractive about this is that we know what the baseline is. So if we have one parentally derived allele expressed, it controls gene dosage by doing this. So it, it will be necessarily similar across all people. So on average, we do expect that about 50% uh, methylation uh, will be expected, give or take, at an ICR. So that makes anything outside that be an aberrant situation, which is something we cannot say in methylation marks whose origin we do not know and whose function we have no idea what they do. So the other uh, thing that the other thing that we are leveraging here uh, about imprint control regions is that the silencing of one of these alleles. It, it, it happens within a cis-acting region of CPG sites. And these are established very, very early before tissue specification. And for practical purposes, what that means is you have an exposure that for which you become responsive and that molecular response is captured at that time and it's going to be like that in every tissue, making it possible to then sample any tissue and be able to get the information you need. And the other uh, characteristic that we are leveraging is that these cis-acting CPG sites, they regulate multiple genes. They, 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 they regulate gene clusters so that learning about one of these teaches us about a multitude of um, of this uh, of of of, uh, of these genes, and apparent loss of uh, methylation in response to these environmental exposures that is called loss of imprinting has been actually associated with multiple diseases. We the first one we saw was in two thousand and three when the loss of imprinting of the IGF two was related to uh, with, with like a, a crazy odds ratio related to colon cancer. 
um, by the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, group. And also aberrant methylation that is over is overrepresented in not just um, that cancer, but also in neurological disorders and, uh, and metabolic disorders. So these are aberrant methylation patterns that we know have been associated with diseases. We know what aberrant means because it is too far outside what we think is reasonable, which is the 50% give or take. Uh, the other um, characteristic that we do leverage, and I think it's, it's very attractive, is the fact that they seem like they're networked. They seem like they're networked to where um, at least in mice, it seemed like you actually only needed to know um, a few in order to say there is aberrant methylation here and it has affected an entire gene network. Uh, these are the ones that we study a lot. Um, um, but if we think about this one here is what uh, uh, Dr. Varald had thought that it was the imprinting hub where if this got dysregulated, the entire imprinting network was dysregulated. She did this based on uh, bioinformatics. It seemed in real life, and people are beginning to test this now because now we know where imprinted genes are, um, it seems that this is not the case, but it seems that uh, this ZAC, which in humans is called plug L1, it seems like it regulates at least about 14 of these networks. It's not, it's not, it's not all of them the way she had predicted. But so, so what this means is that you actually can learn a lot from selecting which ones, which networks uh, to 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 go for. So this is an important set of genes. And um, I, I, I know that a lot of you know that we just stopped looking at them because we just didn't know where they were. But we know that, I mean, there are people who are working on Angelman syndrome. Um, then they're trying, they actually, uh, Dr. Philpott has been working on this for some time. And his idea is to restore uh, imprinting at just one of those regions. So there is practical applications to this. It's not. Um, not merely in academic exercise. And once we find out where these are, uh, people are beginning to open up and start uh, studying them more. The most um, studied imprinted gene, in fact, this was the first discovered uh, to be imprinted was, was the IGF2. So this is monoallelically expressed. Uh, we don't know whether this monoallelic expression, some of it is controlled from the third exon of IGF2, right, and expressed on the paternal, on, on the paternal allele. And then there is a very large um, intergenic region that is somewhere uh, intergenic to IGF2 and H, H, H19, which seems also to get methylated and control. Uh, so we go call both of these uh, the ICRs. Are they both really ICRs? Maybe one of them is, but they seem to behave like, uh, like uh, ICRs. Anyway, all aberrant methylation at this was also associated with, uh, um, it's altered with gene expression. And this is the Dutch farming study that looked at this way back. And this was really encouraging because it was the first time we said, this is the first imprinted gene to be, to be described and we are seeing that people who are exposed to severe caloric input are actually different from those people that were not. And this was just based on 60 people, right? And it was many, many years later, these people in their 50s, when they uh, looked at this, uh, this differential methylation. And this is an, an example of another one. And the reason I'm showing you this is because we actually have worked on this a little bit more. So it's structured exactly the same way. You have an intergenic region, you have uh, uh, one that is not. And um, the um, methylation actually controls uh, the expression of the gene and the parent methylation is associated with the decreased transcription and hypermethylation is an established risk factor for metabolic um, and neurological disease. So we go and measure in these 600 children, 
methylation levels and then come and map them on that map where we had lead and cadmium. And what we are seeing here is areas where we have hypermethylation when you say hypermethylation is 75th percentile and higher. And what you're finding is that there is hypermethylation, but it's not just cadmium here. It seems it's going beyond that. So what we're trying to figure out is why did that happen? So we do a regression analysis, we find associations, but when we start stratifying by ethnicity, what we are seeing is that it's only in one group. So maybe that's what we are seeing that, um, uh, that spill over. But what this is telling us is we need to find all of these imprint control regions. So we went in and uh, conducted whole genome by sulfide sequencing. We are still in the process of doing this. Um, and we are still in the process of this too. But the first one is now uh, complete. I'm sorry, this is a busy slide, but what I wanted to show you was that these were the uh, tissues that we used. So we had the three tissues representing the three germ layers, and then did a whole genome by sulfide sequencing, looking for that 50% methylation, give or take. Uh, and our give or take was uh, 15%. And we're looking for those areas that if you say they're cis-acting, we wanted them to have at least five CG sites or more. And then we went for the garments because what we want is if there is hemimethylation, you also want to make sure that <clears throat> if it's hemimethylated, then it should be produced by just one allele right, should be either in the sperm where the egg is zero or, uh, or vice versa. So we did that and at the end came up with these 1,488 hemimethylated regions and we were able to produce um, a chip. And uh, this uh, website here is where it's actually attached to the, uh, 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 the genome browser. And if you look at it, what the regions we are looking for, this is the plug L1, the one that we call ZAT, you're seeing that green falls within that hemimethylated region. And this is already known uh, in that MEG3 that I was showing you. It's already known you are talking about hemimethylated regions. And then the ICR that was known was small. And now what we found was actually it may stretch that much more instead of just there. And the same thing here, we have the known ICR and then what we found to also meet the criteria of ICRs. Anyway, so this would be the new ones that we, the examples of the new ones that we found. So then the question is, can we apply them to this disease that is, um, a problem, right? And here we are working with um, the neurologist uh, at Duke uh, and the geneticist and a geneticist at, uh, uh, at NC State and the graduate student. So what we, the reason we are doing it is because it is, it is one of the most common uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, the, uh, the the disease burden is really high. It supposedly is going to be the sixth most common uh, cause of death um, right now. And uh, the non-genetic variation accounts for, for, for very little. But we don't have any non-environmentally responsive biomarkers here. Uh, and treatment options available in the development of, uh, in, intended to slow down progression have uh, are, are very, very good. Well, all of us know the risk factors, uh, the risk factors, I mean, being, be, being female, uh, ethnic minorities tend to have this disease more, and there are some, arguably, that they are uh, uh, modifiable risk factors that can uh, be as high as, uh, as 40%. So what we're trying to do here is, this is the time that you, that is gets diagnosed, right? We have amyloid beta, uh, which is thought to be the first step. 
And then the tau accumulation that is supposed to occur later, but clinical symptoms do not really show up until you have mild, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, so the question then becomes, is there a fraction of this disease that can be detected uh, early, say in your doctor's office using these ICRs, right? And uh, be because that's really what uh, the goal um, of these ICRs is. So we do the same thing. We start with the brain samples where we get, um, um, Oh, this is this is where I was talking about what is out there. Uh, the data that are out there are very limited. And so our analysis started with the autopsy samples and we had 17 that came out of the Duke uh, uh, brain bank. Uh, it included uh, blacks and whites uh, and uh, about, uh, and we were looking for a 10% methylation difference. And then we went to a different uh, study that the neurologist uh, head together in order to get that head um, 105 in order to compare what we were seeing in the brain with what we were seeing in the blood. And using the same um, strategy, looking at everybody in blacks, in whites, and then you come up with these differentially methylated regions and run them through those um, 1,488 ICRs, and we came up with 120 that we. Um, associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And what was surprising was that a lot of them seemed like they were found in um, blacks and not uh, in, in, in whites. And what was really reassuring was that 15 of the 27 of these ICRs that we found in whites also, we found in mixed leukocytes in a different population of 105, right? And then the 56, of the 81, we also found. And looking at the cadmium-related adult population of those DMRs, running through those, we found a few were also related to cadmium. I mean, this data are pretty rudimentary. And if you look at the actual imprint control, a lot of these we know about, right? So these are imprint control regions we recognize. Right, and all of this seem like they are perturbed in Alzheimer's, both in blood as well as in um, uh, in in the brain. Uh, what I wanted to end with is the, is to uh, show you this. So this is one of those regions, right? The the uh, the mast mast IT. This region here, and. What we are seeing here is that you're seeing hemimethylation. This is what we used to know as the ICR. And this is the candidate that we found. And it seems like um, when we actually look at it in, in the genome browser, this is, this is, this is the non-ICR. This is what we think is an ICR based on our algorithm. And this is the ICR we find in blocks. And this is the ICR we find in whites. Um, and, and this is what we find in everybody. In fact, what we are looking at is we are looking at the same region, right? Our algorithm would suggest these are many, many uh, regions because this is an ICR, this is an ICR, right? But this looks like we are talking about the same region. So it does kind of like give you that sanity check that, you know, at least for some of them, um, we are onto something. So what are the next steps here? Um, th this, is, this is really exciting. I mean, I don't know if I, 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 uh, <laughs> I show that enthusiasm, but I'm really excited about this. Anyway, so as we refine this, and, and, and one way of refining is, is okay, before you said uh, 50 plus or minus 15, really is that how it works? Right, maybe not. Maybe what you need to do is to see where the gradual fall off is. Right, when you stay, when you have like um, a fifty percent methylation, and then when it really drops off, maybe that's where you should stop and not wait and then and then just chop off at uh, uh, fifty plus or plus or minus. So this is one of the things that we are doing now to try and refine. But uh, because it's on a sequencing platform. 
we are able now to run this through. So right now we just ran through another 200 cases and controls. Um, and uh, we are analyzing the data right now. And the other thing that um, happened while we were developing that chip is that Illumina, who produces the arrays, also decided they were going to include about 1,000 of those CPGs from the array into their EPIC uh, version two, which means this can be tested. Uh, they have the manifest. We have the manifest and it's all with Illumina and they have that manifest so we can know which ones uh, they are and, and maybe test and see if uh, any of them are associated with our uh, disease of interest. And uh, what we are doing also now is uh, we are trying to test the efficacy of these methylation patterns at ICR uh, to see whether um, they are associated with common chronic diseases. Uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, the Philpot lab is really interested in thinking about, about therapeutics for this. Um, and right now, that bioinformatics uh, uh, P30 employee who is now turned into a graduate student. Here's the one that is developing the pipeline for the uh, for the ICR platform. So there should be one by the end of the year. So I, with that, I think I am going to stop and wait for questions. So much for a very comprehensive presentation. We will have time for questions. I noticed that you gave a lot of data about um, education level with income brackets, and you said the average person there average income is under 38. Yeah. I wanted to know if you had any more um, information about the kind of jobs that those people do, because I know that North Carolina has a lot of universities, so is it people who are mostly in construction? Did you guys have any data surrounding the work they do? Actually, uh, for that particular population, yeah. we didn't. We went to the census to go and find out who lived there because okay. all we, we had was that map that was troubling. Yeah. We wanted to report back to the population, but we needed to know a little more and collect a little more data. So these, these are census-derived data. So I, I didn't look. I probably should have at the census data to see what they did. Yeah. Um, oh, no, so, uh, you should have faster so exposure. Do you have any idea what the source of those exposures? You know, it's difficult to, to say what the source is um, because it, it used to be an industrial city, right? So, it, it's, it, it's hard. To know, but what we do know is that all those houses around that area were once owned, all of them, by Lucky Star up until the 40s. That's all. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. This is really exciting to think that we can have this cheap with these imprint control regions. That sounds uh, amazing. And I was wondering. Once that's available and we can start using it, uh, is it relevant to study like in ad adult uh, exposure that happen in adulthood, or is that something that we really need to think about this early life uh, influences? Or is that? I see. Yeah, yeah because I am not yeah, sure. I see your for instance, if I have yes. a cohort mm -hmm. with this mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. in adult populations, but I don't really have any information on early life. Right. Is it right. still relevant for us to do to try to understand? Does this matter, mm -hmm. or maybe not? Mm -hmm. I am not sure myself. I mean, I don't um, know it's been asked. Yeah. You know, like, so I, I think I think that the question you're raising about having age range specific DNA methylation marks or other epigenetic marks to mark the relationship with those that are responsive to exposure is a really important one. So what these are able to do, uh, they're able to capture aberrant occurrences that occurred in, re in relation to exposures back before tissue specification. The question you can ask in adults though is, did that increase susceptibility 
to the disease you are seeing now because they were established that then that question of is this case control or not is somewhat muted. Like if you think about the Dutch famine, they took the IGF-2 and that was amazing because it was, while the design itself was processional, they were going for that early exposure that occurred during around conception, around conception. And it was able to capture that and retain it and be able to share with the scientists 50 years later, right? So then, this because I was very interested by what you mentioned that we might be able to get these biomarkers of environmentally responsive mm -hmm. uh, biomarkers. Yes, that sounds yes. that sounds great. If we if it helps us to recreate these past exposures that we cannot measure, so and, and that's exactly what this does, but for that period, mm -hmm. right? So you can envision a situation where you use, say, whole genome by self-exequencing sequencing and do it for children one to five and come up with another set of marks. They may overlap, they may not, but you could come up with a panel that you can then test for which ones of these are stable, right? And maybe do another one because we know there are some developmental windows that are really important, like puberty. Maybe do another one there. Right, And then you get those environmentally responsive, at the beginning, the most obscure of all times. Then we go to where we have a little more sample, right? Because we do have samples for children one to five. Mm -hmm. And develop a similar type of panel. And do it again, puberty. And then again, maybe early adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think it is, your work is so fascinating. I've followed it for a long time. Um, one of the things that I wonder about now is you talked about how one ICR regulates multiple genes. One of the things that's always been interesting and that we might be able to do an echo is try to understand comorbidity. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you know of any research that's been done looking at ICRs in relation to comorbid diseases in either children, I guess, or in adults. But I was thinking more about children. I, I think people have looked at individual ICRs because all we had was 20, 25. And it was hard to discern any patterns, right? But now that we do have, actually, I think that there is a, a um, person at Clemson who is using this chip, for this chip to do exactly that in twins. I mean, I don't know why she, why exactly she's doing, looking at comorbid conditions in twins, but she's doing that in about a hundred people. Yeah, I think it's something that we just don't understand very well. I mean, we see comorbidity, yeah. but we don't understand necessarily why. Yeah. And looking for, you know, sort of see, likely that yeah, the problem the cluster. Yeah, one spot. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. There's a question online. Oh, oh. you the online person about her. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I had. Um, uh, you mentioned at one point that we don't have any environmental markers for Alzheimer's. And I'm wondering, what do you mean by environmental? Could lifestyle be also considered an environmental factor? And if yes, how would you tease it out? Oh, I see. No, what I was trying to say was that we don't have environmentally responsive epigenetic elements that we have actually worked with, right? So it's not, it's not so much the environmental factors themselves, but which of these respond? Which of these marks among, say, the 28 million CVGs out there, which ones are responsive to environmental cues to mediate Alzheimer's? That's what I was trying to say. And by environmental, what, what do you mean? You mean like uh, pollution, toxins, or, or, or you also mean lifestyle, like for example, social connectivity, uh, reading, because when we talk about neurogenerative diseases, I think it's not just the biology yes. that 
that that plays a role, but lifestyle as well. Absolutely. But the, the problem is we, what we haven't done is take these mediators and link them to these exposures you're talking about, right? And that's what we really should be doing. If you have well-measured exposure like that, the social connectivity, and then look at which epigenetic marks get perturbed that also influence outcome, that would be a major contribution, I think. Are there studies like that, you know, that are being either designed or in the, in the process of being carried out? Uh, there is a person at Johns Hopkins who is looking at social support um, during uh, periconception, and she is trying to look at whether imprint control regions get um, perturbed among those that, um, that have less social support. But she told me that she's getting stuck because she sees such big differences in social support by ethnicity, so she, does, she doesn't know what to do now. So I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. We have time for one last uh, question, uh, Alison. Yeah, quick, just quickly. Um, great talk, Catherine. That was awesome. You have all of this really amazing sequencing data. Did you identify any SNPs or like genetic variability that was associated with the ICRs? That could be MQTLs or or other sorts. Of yeah, actually, markers? yeah, yeah. Actually, the student who was doing, who was doing the uh, the who, did, who prepared the libraries, I asked her to look at one of those regions, the messed one, mm -hmm. and and yeah, what she found was. Um, some relationship, I mean, it was like the controls where the methylation marks were, a lot of it had some, I mean, there were one, two, I think there were like six genetic polymorphisms in the, in that you didn't find in the. Oh, wow. Okay. But, 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 but again, that was, you know, she did 10, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. This was uh, an amazing presentation. Thank you for being with us. Before closing this meeting, I want to also welcome Dean Fried, who has been kind to join us, and uh, also to congratulate her on uh, receiving the Legion of Honor oh, yes. from, from France. And, and, and the celebration of the French Embassy on Monday. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. and. Uh, well, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>